boys, girls, and those who sexually identify as a Target shopping cart, I'm Mr. Dapperton. And I am Reason. And I'm Lord Killian, and this is an introduction to anarcho-capitalism. Now, if you've never heard of that term before, let me elaborate. Anarcho-capitalism is an economic system in which the government does not exist and companies are regulated by the free market while individuals abide by natural law in the form of the non-aggression principle. Aggression refers to initiating force or fraud against someone, or otherwise imposing costs on third parties. The state is a group of people who have the perceived legitimacy to initiate force over a certain geographical area. Since we don't believe that it's right for anyone to commit acts of aggression, and government is just a bunch of people, then we don't believe the government gets to commit acts of aggression either. Now, I know what you're thinking. Don't we already live in a capitalist society? Well, the answer is no. The society we live in today is called corporatism. You're probably wondering what the difference between corporatism and capitalism is. Well, in a capitalist society, you get to vote with your dollars. If you don't like what a business is doing, then all you have to do is not support it. And when enough people stop supporting that business, it will go bankrupt. That's called the free market regulating itself. But in a corporatist society, the state decides in part what companies deserve our business. Through regulation and subsidies, they pick winners and losers and dictate the terms of doing business. Bigger corporations buy power from the government through lobbying and kickbacks to have new regulations put in place that will choke the competition, or as economists call it, regulatory capture, while government uses taxes and central banking to prevent the market regulating itself. When a business is going bankrupt and government bails it out, that is corporatism. That's what America is becoming more and more of. A corporatist monstrosity with government exercising more and more control. Picking winners and losers and making things more expensive for the consumer while forcing them to have fewer options. So can we please stop pretending that America is some kind of bastion of perfect capitalism? It isn't. It's not even the closest in the world. It's currently number 17 on the Index of Economic Freedom, tied with Denmark. The Netherlands, the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are all examples of countries that are more capitalist than the United States. But in a free market economy like anarcho-capitalism, the best businesses will thrive while the unethical and inefficient ones go bankrupt. People would be free to create Uber and Lyft and offer cheaper and easier rides. And if the taxi companies couldn't compete, they wouldn't have a government to go whining to like they do today. That is the nature of competition in the free market. For a few minutes, I want you to look at the state as a business. It has a monopoly on the use of force, and you are forced to associate with it. Now, government also provides services like health care, food stamps, and police. You may agree that you want these services, but the state doesn't let you pick and choose. If you like food stamps, but not war, you still have to pay for both. And since the state doesn't let you take your money elsewhere, it is in fact stealing from you. Not to mention the fact that it's crowding out any private markets for these. Before government meddling in healthcare, for example, we had mutual aid societies that were voluntary, but worked out the way statists would like universal health care to work, only without all the problems we're seeing from it, because universal health care is a monopoly forced on people. And if you're going to say that there's no way the private sector could provide, say, police services, well, how would you know? They're not allowed to try. The state steals from you by denying cheaper and better alternatives the market might create in its absence. The state steals from everyone. If you don't think they're stealing from you, then don't pay your taxes and see what happens. First, you'll receive notices from the state telling you to pay your taxes. If you continue not to pay, they will take you and kidnap you and throw you in a cage, seize your property, and if you resist, they can kill you. Don't believe me? Look up a guy named Eric Garner. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds a lot like theft and extortion by a criminal mob to me. The government is just one big gangbang, and we have to pay protection money to them, or they can kidnap you, steal from you, hold you for ransom, and kill you if you resist. Think about any time you have to deal with bureaucrats, whether it's the DMV or the Social Security office or paying a ticket at the courthouse or whatever. 
How easy or convenient do they make it for you? You have to fill out form FS16-1982 stroke J or whatever instead of, say, simply going to a website like you do when you pay your credit card bill or do anything else in the market. With a free market, there's competition, so they have to make it easier for you because you can always leave. With government, you don't have a choice. By the way, have you ever noticed that when you do, that there's no good place to park because all the good spaces are reserved for bureaucrats, judges, clerks, supervisors, or whatever? When was the last time you saw Walmart do that? Walmart tells their people to park in faraway spots and leave the prime spots for customers. Because if they don't, you might go to Target or somewhere else. But again, the courthouse or the DMV or Social Security office doesn't have to worry about that. That's why it's such a bear doing something simple like renewing your driver's license. You have to fill out a bunch of forms, take them to different places, go to a special place to take your picture, and wait for it to show up in the mail. If that were done by a free market company, you could do all that online or with a smartphone app. Just log in, pay with your credit card, take your picture, and then they'll give you a tracking number so you know when to expect it. If Amazon were in charge of it, that's how it would happen. Because they have to worry about competition, but your state bureaucrats don't. Now, you may be wondering how anarcho-capitalism will work without government-enforcing laws. Well, it's quite simple, actually. Libertarians base their ideals off a philosophical understanding derived from first principles called the non-aggression principle. The non-aggression principle, or NAP, in the simplest terms, states that the initiation of force is not logically justified, and in doing so, those who are having force initiated against them have the right to use equal or greater force to correct for this act of aggression. Rights exist in a negative context, as they are passive and require no initiation of force to protect, and can only be taken away from an individual through an initiation of force. You may have heard this referred to as natural law, but some people complain that there isn't a law the way there is law of gravity. These people are missing the point. The point of natural law is that it isn't being imposed arbitrarily by other human beings. There is actually a logical basis for it. You can't just make up whatever you want. A lot of times, people will come back with some example or other and want to know how you can determine who is in the wrong using the nap. They do come up with some cases that are difficult, but there are also cases that will be difficult in any system. Just because you come up with a scenario where it's difficult to tell who it was that initiated the force doesn't mean that whoever did so wasn't in the wrong. Problems of investigation are not problems of principle. The map is there so that we can determine our rights deontologically. And the whole point of a system of deontological ethics is that arguments for violating them are never as reliable as they first appear. So then what specifically are human rights under natural law? It all begins with self-ownership. You own yourself. You own your time. You own the thoughts in your head, your body, and anything it might do or have done to it, and the fruits of any labor it produces. To deny self-ownership would mean that someone else could legitimately claim this power over you, making you their slave. All rights are derived from self-ownership. As John Locke described them, they are life, liberty, and property. These are natural human rights because they require no initiation of force to be defended and exist in a negative context, meaning that they impart no obligation on anyone else. Anything that does isn't a right at all, but a privilege. Your right to life is the right to your future. Someone who kills you is robbing you of your future and everything you might have done with it. Your right to liberty is the right to your present, everything you can do in the here and now. Anyone who puts you in chains and enslaves you is robbing you of your present. And your right to your property is the right to your past, and everything you've done in the past to accumulate all the possessions you have. Anyone who steals from you is robbing you a part of your past. Life, liberty, and property, the right to your past, present, and future. Anyone that would deny you any of these things is denying you your right to self-ownership. Notice that what isn't included is something that's laughably called intellectual property. Actually, it wasn't called that in the olden days. It was actually called censorship until people realized that censorship was a bad thing because freedom of speech is an inalienable human right, and infringing on it is an infringement of liberty. So they had to rename it in terms of property to try and cover up for the fact that it is censorship. 
But if you hear an idea from someone or read something they wrote or listen to some music they performed, those things are now in your head and they become your ideas too. You have a right to express those ideas, either verbatim if you like them the way they are or derivative work if you'd like to improve on them. If you don't accept this and you think intellectual property is a form of actual property, then really you need to answer one question. How can you enforce it without initiating force? Real property rights only require defensive force against those who would take the property away. But if you write a song and someone else is merely singing it, how could you stop them without committing aggression against them? So let's answer some of the common arguments that statists have against anarcho-capitalism. But first, let's define statism. Since anarcho-capitalism is the consistent application of the non-aggression principle, a statist is someone who thinks that there is at least one issue somewhere where the initiation of force is justified. In other words, they think that force should be initiated if it's for something they agree with. Whoever would be initiating that force is a state, and generally they are given authority to do so over a certain geographical area, and statists will generally defend it on the basis of good intentions, focusing on that instead of the actual results of the policy they're promoting. But intentions don't matter, only actions and their consequences. One of the common arguments we hear from statists is, well, who will build the roads if there isn't a government? The funniest thing about this argument is it doesn't take consumer needs into mind. Along with that, the needs of businesses. To make it simple, if there were two supermarkets and one had a road to it and the other did not, which one would you go to? I know I would rather use a road than risk busting up my vehicle. The answer is right there. Competition is what makes this argument ridiculous, as there's a profit incentive to have a road that lets you get to that business. And if there are multiple businesses, they can pool their funds to make a larger interconnected road that would allow consumers to reach their businesses and buy their products. But let's think about something. What have government roads been but one massive subsidy to the gasoline-powered automobile industry? Without government roads, what would have happened? People wouldn't have just given up on the benefits of travel. They would build the roads themselves. Or if they didn't, then they might just plant crabgrass in the rights of way and get around on hovercraft. Or build people movers like Robert Heinlein wrote about. Just because government did things one way doesn't mean that's the only possible way of doing things, or even the best way. Another common argument is without police, how would you protect your property? Which is pretty funny, seeing as private property rights are passive and can only be deprived through the initiation of force. While the only thing that is required to maintain it is that no one attempts to initiate force to take it. Exactly. Property rights as a concept were created to protect people's property from the state. But just for an instant, let's humor this argument. How would private property be protected? Well, first of all, there's our natural right to keep and bear arms. We can do that to act in our own defense and defense of others like neighbors, co-workers, and family members. There's also the option of private security. Now, before you say that private security isn't as effective as state-provided police, I want you to see this. He looks and sounds like a cop. At least it's quiet today. And he and his fellow officers are certainly armed like cops, complete with canine. And when most people hear private security, what do they think? They, they think um, mall cop. No mall cops here. They are security officers with SEAL security. The Civic Association used to contract with the constable's office for a deputy to patrol the area. But now that it's gone with SEAL security, it has anywhere from three to four officers patrolling the streets at any given time and at half the cost. Also cut in half, the number of burglaries. And when a young mother in the neighborhood was recently stabbed multiple times in front of her children. Our guy just was on duty, routine patrol, comes around the corner, is flagged down, sees the assault, draws his weapon, and breaks it up. It's great. I mean, I, I feel a lot better. Um, last month, my dad's car was broken into, and I've heard they've reduced the car thefts here by, by a significant amount. Increasing the neighborhood's sense of security. Now, as you can see, that not only are they more effective, but they cost one-eighth of that of a standard police officer, and they will be on site. Unlike police who take a standard of 15 minutes to arrive, unless you're in a poor or minority area, in which case it could take several hours, if ever. And either way, when they get there, they'll just outline your body in chalk. I don't know about you, but it seems to me that the private sector does a better job on average than that of the state. And this brings up another statist argument. 
wants to keep one person from amassing a lot of guns or hiring mercenaries and waging war and taking over everything. First of all, it's going to cost a lot of money to do so, so whoever tries will be at an economic disadvantage. You'd also need to hope against hope that no one finds out what you're up to, which will be difficult as people notice that you don't have much money and that gun sales are going up all of a sudden. And what happens if you do manage to get all those guns? You're going to be dealing with an armed populace. Each and every door you kick down is likely to have an armed owner or three on the other side of it. You'd be outnumbered and outgunned. And what's going to happen once a bunch of your mercenaries get killed? The rest are going to say it's not worth it and just go home. Of course, in all of these different scenarios, we're assuming the criminal survives his attempt. But remember... People have the right to keep and bear arms, and enough of them would exercise that right that any criminal would be taking a big chance. Not even a mass shooter would have much of an opportunity. A guy named Davi Barker did a study of over a 100 mass shootings and found that when the shooter was stopped by police, the average number of people killed was 14.29, but when stopped by an armed citizen, that number dropped to 1.8. So maybe now you understand why mass killings pretty much only happen in gun-free zones. The fact is, you would have to be 20 miles south of stupid to try something like that in an anarcho-capitalist society. Something else we get over and over again is, who would help the poor? But the fact is, government just doesn't do that good of a job at helping the poor. Before the welfare state, the poverty rate was dropping like a stone, and the poor enjoyed huge amounts of upward mobility. The poor in one year were pretty much different people than the poor the next year who were pretty much immigrants, young people, and other new entrants into the workforce. But Johnson's so-called Great Society, with his wonderful welfare program, stopped that in its tracks. The poverty rate is now a pretty consistent 15%, and we've also seen the destruction of a lot of private charities for the poor, including free clinics and charity hospitals. But let's consider the real issue. How much of our wealth is government soaking up? Government at all levels takes about 52% of the national income in taxes, fees, and so on. So already, we're left with just 48% of our purchasing power. But that's hardly the whole story. Government also robs from us through inflation. They've been doing it continuously since the Federal Reserve was created, such that a dollar is now only worth 4% of what it was then. But let's not go back that far. In fact, let's actually skip the 70s since that was very much an unusual situation. So let's go all the way to 1988, the last year of the Reagan era, when the economy was doing pretty good. According to West Egg Inflation Calculator, $1 in 1988 is the equivalent of $2.06 in 2016. So if government had stopped inflation at that point and went to sound money, each dollar we earn would go twice as far. But no, our dollars only have about 48% of their purchasing power compared to what they did in 1988. Figure that in. 48% of 48% is 23%. So now, government is robbing us of 77% of our purchasing power. But we're not done yet. Government also imposes indirect costs in the form of regulations. We'll show you in a minute how out of control the regulatory state is. But for now, according to a 2013 study in the Journal of Economics Growth, the cost of all this regulation is 277000 a year to the average American family. Our GDP would be $54 trillion instead of just $16 trillion. We are 75% poorer because of federal regulations. And that's not even counting state in local regulations. So basically we're left with 25% of 48% of 48%, leaving us with less than 6% of our purchasing power. And we know that's lowballed because remember, we're not counting state and local regulations or businesses that have been driven out by these costs. So without government, our paychecks will be going over 17 times as far as they are now. Think about this next time you hear this fight for 15 nonsense. Understand that because of government, this means they want you to have the purchasing power of just 86 cents an hour. The rest gets absorbed by this behemoth of a government. And you say we need government to help the poor. Ask yourself, how many poor people would we actually have when someone working at a job that makes just $6,000 a year would have the purchasing power of someone currently making over 100000 It's not even any contest. Poor people would be a thing of the past. Another argument that statists make goes along the lines of, well, if the government doesn't regulate businesses, then what will stop them from exploiting their workers as well as the consumer? Yeah, they love using that word exploit. It doesn't really mean anything, but it sounds bad. 
See, the thing is, in an anarcho-capitalist society, you get to vote with your dollars. So if a company starts to be unethical towards its workers or gouges prices, then all you have to do is support its competitors or stop buying from them, and they will either have to correct this behavior or go under. And of course workers will be free to work elsewhere. If someone's not giving their workers good conditions or the pay they deserve or whatever, there will be a financial incentive for a competing businessman to offer them a job with better pay and conditions. By the way, don't let them snow you. We don't have a problem with people getting together and voluntarily forming labor unions. We're all for free association, and unions that were set up in the past like this offered their workers a lot of benefits, including health benefits, unemployment insurance, and many others. We only object when government monopolizes it. They only allow one particular union to exist in the industry, and they force all workers in the industry to join. But then what incentive do those unions have to make their workers happy, or feel they're getting value for their dues? Another argument that gets used alongside is, well, government regulation is simpler and more effective than the free market regulating itself. When in reality, the government puts out thousands of new regulations a day that generally benefit those who lobby for said regulations. Take a look at the Federal Register. Each business day, the federal government publishes all of the regulations that just went into effect. All of the regulations that take effect in that day. Here's a page from the one for November 20th, 2017. Look at how small the type is. And this is 278 pages long, not counting things like the table of contents. If this were typeset like a novel, it would be over 1,100 pages. These things generally have 1,000 words a page, and it's common to have 200 pages or more. Let's do some math. 200 words in new regulations every day. Average adult reading speed in the U.S. is about 300 words per minute. So that would take the average adult over 11 hours just to read the new regulations that went into effect just the previous day. And they would have to do it all over again the next day. Now you're probably going to point out that many of these regulations won't apply to your business. That's true. But how are you going to know which regulations don't apply without reading it? So, tell us, statist, how is thousands of new regulations a day more simple than not supporting unethical behavior and letting that company go out of business? Now, your biggest question is probably what will prevent monopolies from forming in Kapistan? The truth is, the only thing that makes monopolies is government. Big business influences law and writes law via lobbying. Basically, government's handing out monopolies to whichever big company has money. See, that's what happens when you have rulers. Rulers will always sell you out for money. Without government, there's no way for monopolies to form. If there's no government, there's no rulers. And if there's no rulers, everybody's on an equal playing field. And that's how it should be. Imagine we're in an anarcho-capitalist society and you have the only fidget spinner company. You have a monopoly on fidget spinners. Now, I'm a smaller company and I want to make fidget spinners too and steal the crap out of your monopoly. What are you going to do to stop me? Go ahead. I'll wait. Do, 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 do. There's nothing you can do. There's no government for you to buy and lobby, so there's no way for you to push me out of business. If I want, I'm going to just compete with you and steal your monopoly now. There's nothing you could do about it. Now, a common argument is that the monopoly will just buy off any competitors that spring up. But if your business is at all successful, it'll be really attractive to competitors. How can you buy them all off without going bankrupt? Even if you tried, all it would do is create an incentive for even more competitors. Make a new fidget spinner company, and the monopoly will buy you out. Fast, easy money. Yes, all you'd be doing is creating a market for competitive startups. There's no way that's sustainable. Buy them off, and they win. Don't buy them off, and they still win. The truth is, monopolies could only form when there's somebody with a monopoly of power. So without government, that doesn't exist, and there's nobody to divvy out power. And if there's no power being divvied out, there's nobody being exploited, and everybody's on an equal playing field. You know, the way it should be. When you put all these arguments under simple observation and critical thinking, they aren't very logical and fall apart under the slightest criticism. And whatever arguments you may have, chances are we've already responded to it. So before you come in with your argument for the state, how about checking Google or YouTube to see if there's already a response? You can save us and you a lot of time that way.
And please remember, we can't teach you economics in 140 characters. When we send you to all these other sources, it's because we want you to bone up on the basics so we can have an informed discussion.